Well, welcome to what we're grandly calling Theology in the Real World. It's our series of small group studies that we're doing in the autumn term here at Woody Road. If you've come across this in some other way, welcome. Now, what we do most of the time here at church, whether on Sundays or in our home groups, is we often take a passage of the Bible and we study it and then think about how to apply it. It's what we're doing in Jeremiah on Sunday mornings this term. And my conviction is that's the right way to approach things. Because in just simply working our way through a book of the Bible, what we're saying is this, God sets the agenda. You know, what he thinks matters, well, that's more important than our concerns. He sets the agenda. The problem, of course, though, is this. Life doesn't always work like that. So with the best will in the world, it is quite unlikely that I'll go through a day of my life and the big question will be, what does Jeremiah chapter 24 mean? Unless I suppose it's your job to actually preach it on Sunday. That's not going to be the big question. By and large, it seems to me as Christians, as we go through life, we face three sorts of questions. It might be cultural questions. You know, we're living through a pandemic. How should I react to that as a Christian? Or, I don't know, the Black Lives Matter campaign comes up. And again, we've got to face the question, how should I respond to that from a Christian perspective? Or maybe broader cultural questions. You know, how should we live in an iPhone, iPad generation? You know, with all the technological changes, do we just absorb those as Christians in an unthinking way? How should we actually think about them as Christians? And so as we go through life, those cultural questions should be to the fore. Or maybe that we're facing practical dilemmas. Of all the things that I could do with my time, what should be my priorities? How should I spend my money? Or other practical questions will come along. You know, how should I function as an employer, as a parent, as a son or daughter? And we just face those practical issues. How should we live as a Christian in those sort of contexts? Or perhaps most challengingly of all, we'll face pastoral dilemmas as we go through life. You know, I want to live as a Christian, and yet so often I feel just so anxious. I wake up with, with dark thoughts dominating on my mind. How am I supposed to deal with those? Or every time I feel down, I just go back to my favorite addiction, porn, gambling, or, or something like that. And people don't know about it, but that's my reality. Or perhaps we've got other situations, other pastoral difficulties we face. You know, I want to live for the Lord, but frankly, doubt is my constant companion. So often I'm just not sure that the gospel is true. And we'll face those pastoral, personal challenges as we go through life. And so you see the dilemma. Actually, as we go through life, it isn't so much what does Jeremiah 24 mean that's at the forefront of our minds. It's how should I live as a Christian in our culture? How do I make practical decisions? How do I face some of the personal pastoral dilemmas? And of course, it won't simply be that we'll face those issues personally. You often will end up seeking to encourage others and they'll be going through those challenges and they'll be looking to us for advice. So cultural questions, practical issues, pastoral challenges. Those are things we face as we go through life. And that's what this series is about. How do we as Christians deal with those things? Now, at the moment, actually, my plan for the rest of the term isn't actually worked out because my hope is that across our different home groups, we'll set the agenda. Uh, and my hope is that we'll deal with a mixture of cultural, practical and pastoral questions. So why don't we pause now and in your groups, think about this issue. Of all the sort of cultural, practical, pastoral questions we could face, what do you want to explore in your groups? this term and hopefully the group leaders will feed back to me 
and we'll put an agenda together. So just pause the video. What are the main practical, pastoral, cultural questions you face? And if it's too awkward, to be honest, why don't you just say, well, a friend of mine would be interested in this. Why don't you explore that together for the next 10 minutes or so? Now, let me explore how we're going to handle these questions across this term. Because imagine you, you've got an issue, cultural, practical, pastoral, and I guess the instinctive Christian reaction is to say this, what does the Bible say? And in many levels, that is absolutely right. That's what we'll be doing. We'll be taking an issue and asking, what does the Bible say? But I just want to add a note of caution. You imagine for a moment that you go and visit a doctor and you say, I've got a headache. And the doctor's immediate response is, take two paracetamol, goodbye. Now you might feel slightly short-changed by that. You might think, well, perhaps he, should have, he or she should have asked some more questions. How often do you have a headache? Are there any other symptoms? Because I guess the headache could be down to, I don't know, just tiredness, or frankly, it could be something far more sinister. And of course, the way a doctor will treat you properly is he or she will spend time asking those questions in a bit more detail to explore a proper diagnosis. And that's the approach that I want to take in this series, Theology in the Real World. John Stott, a great church leader in the 20th century, wrote a book called The Contemporary Christian. And in that book, he used a phrase that's quite powerful. He made a plea for double listening. He was addressing various cultural issues, and he said Christians needed to listen hard to the world and listen hard to the Bible. Now, he didn't mean that in exactly the same way. He believed, as we do, that the Bible is God's word of truth. It has ultimate authority. And so his plea wasn't that we listen to the world and listen to the Bible and then try and decide which one we're gonna follow. But he said, unless we listen hard to the world, we're really gonna to struggle to speak to it. You see, we need to listen to the world so we know the underlying ambitions and motivations and, and so we can apply scripture to them. And I want to say that's true culturally, and it seems to me that it's particularly true pastorally, that when we're trying to deal with various issues in our hearts, we need to spend a little bit of time asking questions, listening to our own hearts or as we're helping others listening to them, so that we can speak the truth of the Bible into it. You imagine for a moment somebody who is struggling with anxiety. Yeah, you know, they say, just really anxious at the moment. Now, one level I could respond, stop it. The Bible says, do not be anxious. Go away and stop it. I could do that. Probably as a younger pastor, that was the kind of thing I occasionally did do. But over the years, I've come to learn that it's, it's more helpful to spend a little bit of time exploring the question. Okay, so why are you feeling anxious? What is it that you're particularly worried about? And why do you think that's the case? Because actually only as you begin to spend time exploring that issue, can you really speak meaningfully into it? Francis Schaeffer was another great 20th century Christian leader, and he pioneered the Libri movement. It was a place where sometimes Christians, sometimes those who weren't Christians, but were intrigued went and often there were people with big questions on their minds, big issues, big doubts and big uncertainties and Francis Schaeffer would often meet them. And he said that when he had a meeting with somebody in that position, a Christian wrestling with doubt or a non-Christian with big issues, he would spend at least 50 minutes of any hour simply asking questions and listening. And then in the last 10 minutes, he would give some biblical thoughts or biblical feedback. Because he said, unless I spend those 50 minutes answering questions, I'm going to deal with the symptoms 
rather than the underlying cause of the issue. I've got to listen to carefully to the person to find out what they're actually thinking and feeling before I can apply the Bible into their hearts. And it seems to me the Bible is sympathetic to that sort of reasoning, the reasons why James tells us to be quick to listen. Or one verse I found particularly striking comes from Proverbs. Listen to Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 5. Proverbs 20 verse 5. The purposes of a person's heart are deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out. Do you see the point? Actually, our hearts are like deep waters. You know, there are loads of different things, different currents running through them. And it's the person of insight who'll actually spend time drawing those things out. So we begin to understand what's going on there. And so the approach we're going to use in this series, Theology in the Real World, is, if you like, a, a medical approach. Uh, Howard, Harold Senkbale, I think I've got the pronunciation of that right, he's an American pastor anyway, has written a book for pastors called The Care of Souls, The Care of Souls. And he says that within any pastoral work, there are two phases. He talks about attentive diagnosis followed by intentional treatment. Attentive diagnosis followed by intentional treatment. And I think that applies not just to pastors, that applies to us as we're caring for one another as friends, or even as we're working in our own hearts. There's that attentive diagnosis, that listening, that asking questions, that trying to explore what's going on. And then there is the intentional treatment. How do we apply the Bible to this? What does the Bible say so we can begin to cure the trials and the challenges of our hearts. And so what we'll be doing each week in this series is doing both of those things. We will ask questions. What's going on in culture? What's going on in our hearts? What might be the issues as we face practical decisions? And then we'll think, given that, what has the Bible got to say? What are commands are relevant? Are there any stories that illustrate this? And perhaps above all else, how does Jesus answer this dilemma? Because in the end, what the Bible gives us isn't so much practical advice on every particular issue, so much as how does that issue create longings to which Jesus is the answer? And so that's what we're going to be doing each week. Diagnosis and treatment, particularly thinking how Jesus is the answer to that challenge. And my plea is simply going to be that we do both of those things, that we listen well, but actually that we don't simply listen well. Actually, we don't have to be Christians to listen well, but that we really do apply the right treatment. Because in the end, the answer to the dilemmas of our hearts, and the dilemma of culture, isn't simply our sympathy. The answer is going to be Jesus. And so here's a question for you to ponder in your groups. Of those two things, listening and applying true biblical treatment, which of those are you tempted to miss out? Is there just one you're tempted to do? You're just tempted quickly to give a quick answer? Or, or perhaps are you tempted just to listen and sympathise but never really get to Jesus? Where are you tempted to fall down? And then secondly, how can we grow in doing true biblical medical treatment in our culture and for our own hearts. Just a moment to talk about that, well, perhaps five to ten minutes to talk about that, and then I'll take us through the last section. Well, just for the last uh, five minutes or so, I want to make two general observations on the care of souls. What might help us to do as Proverbs says, to be those who draw out the purposes of the human heart? And the first general bit of advice that I think I've picked up over the years is this. Don't assume that we believe what we say we believe. Don't assume that we believe what we say we believe. Let me explain what I mean. 
Many churches, ours is one of them, have a, a statement of beliefs, a, a doctrinal statement that actually all those who are members are required to sign up to. And of course, we, we do that. And, and genuinely, at one level, we do believe those things that we sign up to. And yet, the reality under pressure at the depths of our hearts is that sometimes we kind of stop believing them. So again, take somebody who is, is just really worried all the time. Often when somebody comes to me in that position, often one of the questions that I'll begin to ask is this. Do you actually believe that God is in control and God is good? Because my suspicion is if you're so worried, it's probably because you're just doubting one of those things. You know, maybe you're worried that God isn't in control of everything and so he isn't in charge of your future. Or, and actually I think this is often more likely, you're not really convinced that he's loving and has got good purposes for your ultimate salvation. Or take somebody who keeps giving in to a particular temptation. Again, one of the issues there is, do you actually believe God is good or do you really think he's a killjoy? You know, the reason he, he says no to that thing you keep giving into is, is actually basically because he wants to spoil your fun. And so you're going to keep giving in because actually you think it's good for you. And actually behind most sin is a doubt that God is really good and is committed to what is best for us. And so again, as we we deal with our hearts, part of it is just going to be exploring it. Actually, am I giving into this because there's some uncertainty in, in what I believe? We'll explore that issue a little bit. But then it's worth pondering this question. If I'm beginning to doubt what I say I believe, or if it's not functioning as a, a kind of controlling reality in my life, why is that actually the case? Why do we doubt these things? And just the, the second little bit of advice I'd like to pass on is this. That as we care for our own hearts and for the hearts of others, it becomes vital to spot the voice of Satan and how that's different to the voice of the Spirit. So Jesus himself describes Satan as the father of lies. Actually, his very name means the accuser. And so we shouldn't be surprised as Christians if some of the stuff we face is just a sense of doubt being cast on the truthfulness and the reliability of God. Because Satan's at work and he's the father of lies. And I think it's particularly the case that for Christians, he often functions as our accuser. And so we're aware of perhaps some sin we've committed. And immediately there's a voice that's saying, well, you've blown it. God doesn't love you now. He's not interested in you now. You're done. And it's no surprise that we face those things because we have an enemy who is described as the accuser. The problem, of course, is this, that so often we don't actually spot that as the voice of Satan. So we think the doubts of us just being rational. We think God doesn't love us because actually God doesn't love us. And again, one of the questions it seems to me vital that we begin to explore with our own hearts and with other people is this. Where do you think that comes from? You know, when you have those thoughts in your head, where do you think that comes from? So that we begin to spot it. And then we can press into the chief encouragement. And the chief encouragement is this, that the Holy Spirit is more powerful in the end than Satan. And he's doing a different work in our hearts and minds. You see, there are ways in which, subtly at least, the work of Satan and the work of the Holy Spirit seem broadly similar. You see, Satan will accuse us of sin, to condemn us. And actually, the Holy Spirit is one who does indeed convict the world of sin. And so at one level, both the Spirit and Satan show us sin. And yet for completely different purposes. You know, the spirit, uh, the Satan shows us our sin so that we just give up, we're just defeated, we're just discouraged, we just feel condemned. 
Whereas the Spirit convicts us of sin, so that we'll run to the Lord Jesus who's standing there with open arms saying, come back. I've died for you. You're welcome. You're loved. Come back, confess sin, and we will enjoy a beautiful, restored relationship again. And it seems to me that one of the most important things for Christians is to begin to spot the difference between the accusing voice of Satan and the convicting voice of the Spirit who is actually then driving us back to the Lord Jesus. And of course, part of just working through these questions, this is why we spend time listening and exploring and talking to each other at a deep level so that we can begin to deal with the depths of the human heart. So that's going to be our basic approach as we work through these issues in the real world over the coming weeks. We'll do the diagnostic question work and then we will think, what does the Bible say supremely? What's the answer that the Lord Jesus gives? Well, why don't you spend some time praying in your groups? Maybe praying about some of the issues that you raised uh, in the, uh, the first section. Maybe praying that actually the Lord would equip us in this time to deal with our own hearts, to deal with others' hearts. And then praying above all else that we would find in Jesus the solution to all our longings.